This is The Express with Gary Allen, your 360-degree view of the world. Now, here's your host, Gary Allen. Ah, good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Express. This is Gary Allen here with you. Uh, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us here on a beautiful, beautiful evening. Um, we have a great guest with us tonight, and he'll be joining us in just about a minute or so, Mr. Scott Farrell. He's a behavioral expert. Uh, the best way to describe uh, Scott is to uh, say that he is a cross between uh, uh, Dr. Phil and Pearl Jam, and we will uh, get to that in just a little bit. But beforehand, I want to give you all kind of an opportunity to figure out how you can stay in touch with me. You can go to my Facebook page, facebook.com, Gary Allen, A-L-A-N, or you can listen to some of these past shows on youtube.com. That'll be Gary Allen, The Express Interviews. And on Thursday night, this show repeats itself at 7 p.m. on diversitybroadcastnetwork.com and then on progressivevoices.com. And I hope everybody's been having a great week since we spoke last. A lot is going on in the world, and I mean a whole lot is certainly happening in the world on the political arena. EW, you've been having a good day so far? Oh, yeah. We're preparing for another round of storms in Texas. As far as I know, Fort Worth and Dallas area is getting hammered right now. And uh, for those that are in that area, please take cover. Yeah, please do. I believe our guest is on the line. As I told you before, his name is Scott uh, Farrell. He's a graduate of Greensboro College. He's one of the top students in his class. He got a degree in mental uh, retardation, learning disability, and behavioral disorders. Scott became a teacher. And part of the curriculum and part of his classes were seen in two different movies. Uh, one was, I think it's Nell, N-E-L-L, with Jodie Foster, and The House of Cards with Kathleen, Kathleen Turner and Tommy Lee Jones. He has also uh, taught special education for well over 20 years, giving, uh, uh, giving him a great deal of experience with dealing with all types of children, teens, and adults, and, of course, The Family Matters. Scott is a best-selling author. And he also hosted his own radio show called Modern Family Rules. His book out there, his new book, It's Not Them, It's You, on uh, a business behavior. And uh, I want to welcome him to you. And EW, I, by the way, I can hear you in the background there, EW. Uh, I just want to all let you know that uh, – he is known as America's behavioral expert, and he is also considered a cross between Dr. Phil and Pearl Jam. So we're in for an interesting evening. Mr. Scott Farrell, welcome to the program. Hey, Scott, man, you thank there? you so much for having me. Thank oh, you. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's absolutely my pleasure uh, to have you on this program. And before we go too far, I just want to say hello to Randy Jones out there. Thank you so much, Randy. I know you're with me every, every week, and so I always look forward to that. And thanks, Scott, for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us here on The Express. And, you know, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you briefly that my situation I talked to you about yesterday has escalated into a one-game suspension um, for my behavior or lack thereof. Right. Wow. It's yeah. a shock, but uh, that sounds yeah. about par for the course. Yeah, it's because I probably questioned the authority, and you folks out there don't know what we're talking about, but that's okay. It's an inside thing. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, go over this with you because you and I both suffer from the same thing. Jay Leno suffers from it, and so did uh, Mr. Canal, who, who uh, Canelli actually, who uh, who produced a lot of TV shows out in Los Angeles, and that is dyslexia. Mine wasn't discovered, believe it or not, until I was pretty much in my last year of high school. Um, I always thought I was just kind of stupid when it came to math, and I wasn't very bright when it came to spelling. And that's when one of my teachers who was bright enough, and I don't even think they called it dyslexia back then, but uh, discovered that my brain waves weren't working properly. When did you discover yours, and, and how did you overcome it to be where you are today? Uh, my mentor in college, I got studying with a gentleman named Dr. Dennis Shaw, mm -hmm. came to me one day and he said, okay, we got two choices here. Either you're an idiot or you can't read. He goes, I'm going to go with the read part because she got straight A's. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, How, what did you do to compensate? Well, I was in the performing arts. So I have a photographic memory. I remember everything. I can sit through an entire lecture and not take one note. Wow. And if I read something, it, it's there. So I was always able to compensate. And in college, I had a formula. 
I would do everyone's <laughs> homework. So we'd have a group homework session. I'd do all their homework mm-hmm. if they would type my papers. Ah. And it worked. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder how many people out there and, 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 you know, it's a very serious problem. Um, It's one that Jay Leno often talks about. And and when I've been in his company, we've talked about it both. His is more prevalent with spelling than necessarily mine is. Mine is more with numbers and uh, henceforth why algebra and math and I never really got going. As a matter of fact, when I when I take down somebody's phone number, I have to do it twice or ask them to give it to me twice just to be sure, because sometimes I still invert numbers, you know, and I see numbers yeah. differently. Um, but I, I don't know what the percentages are, but there are a lot of Americans that are walking around that have never been diagnosed with it that think they're just stupid or they don't have the ability to be or do where they want to be in life as far as their career goals because you know, because of dyslexia. What just just before we get into the meat of this program, what should people do if they think they have it or they don't know that they have it and to be tested? Where can they go? Well, now you can. I just looked up the the rate for you. It's about one in five. They say. I, I don't mm-hmm. know how how uh, accurate that is. I mean, I spent twenty plus years in school system. Actually, the schools are set up. If you have a suspicion of, if you've got a school-aged child, you just go to uh, the administration at the school. However, if you're an adult, there are several independent centers that will gladly test you, let you know. Heck, you can actually go online now and just type in dyslexia test and take an online test. Yeah, and then then you read that backwards, and how do you know you got it right? I'm being foolish yeah. for the moment. I'm being foolish. Yeah, yeah. How did you get How did you get the moniker America's Behavioral Expert? Doctor Phil meets Pearl Jam. Well, about 2009, I did a TV commercial um, at the Roosevelt in Hollywood. I was mm-hmm. selected as one of America's top behavior experts, and the gentleman interviewing me was Bill O'Reilly's producer. Oh. and that's how I got the nickname. Was from those guys. Oh, okay. Well, you got a connection in television somehow, and you've always been ar- been around it. Let's uh, let's go back um, and probably figure out why you went into the field that you went into, considering your own personal background. Growing up was rough. Your family life was rough. Um, you you had parents that were you know you had a parent rather that wasn't exactly the nicest human being on earth. Um, and uh, it was a violent upbringing. Alcoholism was involved. You always slept at, with a gun underneath your pillow. Uh, and after high school, you got into the rock and roll life, sex, drugs, and all the good stuff that we all dream about. Where was the turning point for you? When did you finally realize, hey, I got to stop this behavior, which probably propelled you into the direction you've been going in for the last 20 plus years? Um, when did you realize, hey, I got to get out of this? I was going to commit suicide, actually. I, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's funny. I did sleep with a gun underneath my pillow. I've been raped by, you name it. It, it had happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I was one of these guys who, I, I had Lemmy's lifestyle. I would take a handful of pills and then wash it down with a fifth of Jack Daniels. I'm, it's not a success formula. No. And I had, I, I it, the story, I, I actually got to tell this tomorrow to an association. I had hated Christians. I made a life out of being an atheist. I was proud of it. Uh, I wanted to be in the Church of Satan. And uh, I had a strong dislike for humans. And a guy told me about Jesus, and it saved my life. Because the very next week, I already had my suicide planned out. Really? Wow. Just wasn't worth it anymore. Yeah. I went through it. Um, Mine was a temporary thing. I was going through a job situation in Chicago where I was living with my wife. I just moved from Los Angeles to Chicago, couldn't find work. If I mean, I, I literally couldn't find anything. And I almost right. committed suicide. I mean, it was, a, it was a momentary, quick second thought, and it was gone within the same amount of time that it came on. It wasn't anything that I've thought about since. I mean, I love life. But, boy, when you're thinking about committing suicide, you have really got to be hitting the wall and thinking there's nothing beyond this for me. Why am I here? Am I hitting on the nail there? No, I, I unfortunately I have to stand in many great sides with suicide um, victims. I don't call them victims, actually candidates, whatever you want to call them, and explain to their families why it happened. And I always look at people and go, the, the event that took place was they had to make a choice. And what was the choice? Continue life as it is without any answers or any hope. Mm-hmm. All they're looking for is hope. Give me a glimmer of hope, just like me. I'd already planned it out. I knew I was going to do it. I knew what I was going to do, and I had peace about it. 
But all I wanted was one glimmer of hope, one step, something. Give me the key to some form of, 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 of happiness, joy, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And if you can do that, then they won't do it. There's no reason. Right. But once you hit the pit of hell, and you think the pit of hell will be your reality for, for eternity, then why not? It's always about options. Yeah. And sometimes I guess people feel as though they just don't have those options anymore. Correct. You know, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I've been there. And let's talk a little bit and I want to do this. When did you decide that this is what you wanted to choose for yourself in life, teaching, helping others, uh, particularly children and parents and uh, people who are dysfunctional in marriage? And we're going to get into some of the particulars of that. But when did you decide this is where you wanted to go? Was it because of uh, how you grew up or was it something that you felt drawn to anyway? I, uh, well, yeah, I, I had a cousin, um, my cousin's since gone, but he had Down syndrome when I was a boy. Mm-hmm. And then I walked into the classroom one day, I saw Terry, and I met the most beautiful girl in the world. And I got to kiss her. It's not every day you get to kiss the most beautiful girl in the world. Oh, her wow. name's Ryan, seven years old, and she was in a wheelchair. And she, the only response she had to the world was blinking and smiling. So I oh, think God. she could do. She won my heart. And um, we were close every day after that. And actually went back, got my degree, um, mm-hmm. ended up with the best mentor on the face of the planet, and proceeded that way. Because with my degree, I basically was able to get a grad degree in conjunction with my, my undergrad degree at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got enough hours. And I also had a behavior component clipped onto it. So I knocked out five, five things at one time. But that was it. That was that moment. I got to kiss the most beautiful girl in the world, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt this is what I had to do the rest of my life. Yeah, isn't that and that wonderful when you when yes. you discover that that thing that passion? It's the same thing that I was I was saying to EW before we went on the air. You know, it, it doesn't matter what happens in my personal life and that issue that you and I discussed yesterday. Uh, I'm doing what I love to do, and since I'm going to be moving on to a radio station this fall, it even enhances my life more to find out and to talk to people and to be on the air and and, and use my big mouth, which is all God gave me, because he didn't give me <laughs> he didn't give me looks, even even though our our mutual friend Bruce Marin loves me, but uh, you know uh, he he didn't give me looks. But it is a wonderful, beautiful thing when God and you come together. And you're doing the thing that you're meant to do on this planet. It really is a yeah. most satisfying thing. How did you feel when uh, when some of your classroom activities were featured in two major motion pictures? It, it got there on the tail end of that. And, and I was amazed because what we went in the state of North Carolina, I, I worked at a, one of the two facilities in the United States. And it's an amazing school that is sponsored by UNC Chapel Hill. And they had a casting call for authentic children with autism. Well, I think we fit the bill. The whole school was full of autistic children. Yeah. And they came, and the movie Nail was the most telling. I always tell people, the the little girl in the movie actually bit through my left arm. And um, so I have a connection to Hollywood now. Ah. But they wanted real students who had real families that they could help. And it just so happens the class I was part of got into movies. And it was amazing. Well, that, that had a great... Yeah, yeah. I was very glad they used, they chose authenticity instead of actors, and they got exactly what they wanted out of it. Yeah, I mean that that's a, you know I said this once before uh, about children with disabilities, whether it be autism or something else, or or even uh, MLS or, or muscular dystrophy or something. Children who have disorders, they don't have problems. They're not handicapped. They don't classify it that way. But people. Who, who, who have some disorder or, or they have a, you know, something wrong. Um, they are the most giving, loving children on earth where if it happened to an adult, we're miserable. But children just, they, 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 they accept it and they're loving and they're caring and they're wonderful. And, and, and I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you people who work with children like that get through it, except that you're doing a wonderful thing and those children must love you for it with all their heart. Yeah, I mean, it has its days. It's just you understand. It comes from understanding. You understand the condition. Mm-hmm. You understand what you've got to do. You understand it's a job, and you understand that you've, you've got to do that job. Right, right. All right, let's get into some of the things that, that I, I mentioned that I was going to get into with you about, and that is 
behavioral issues with children and right. and the home life. Um, we know that there are a lot of mothers and fathers out there who should not have children. They're cruel to their children. They're mean to their children. They're mean. They're disgusted human beings. <clears throat> Maybe they're upset because they didn't get anywhere in life. I, I honestly don't know. Right. But, you know, if you're born with a Joan Crawford kind of a mother or a father, uh, how do you get past that as an adult? Where do you go to get help? And, 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 and what do you do growing up to, to get through with those terrible, horrible experiences? Uh, my one's escape. I, I was in the theatrical arts. I sang and performed. Um, I, if you've ever seen Sherlock Holmes, my, my uh, manager calls me Shirley. Uh, she says I fit that deal. I'm, I'm kind of Shirley and, and, and uh, Sheldon on Big Bang. Mm. Mine was comic books. Mine was escape. Mine was fantasy. I realized that eventually I would get old enough to leave. Mm-hmm. And I would be able to make my own way, make my own decisions, and get away from the hell that I encountered as a child. Mm-hmm. And um, that's one way to handle it. And the thing is, when we're 118, if we're not removed from the home, we cannot change the environment. But we have to endure that environment while we're there. And we have to have some type of escape to be able to endure it, or we will commit suicide. Mm-hmm. And mine was fantasy, theatrics, athletics. Um, I did anything I could to stay out of the home stay with other people and stay focused on a, a, a different activity than what I was enduring at home. Mm-hmm. What if a, a child is in a situation like that where a father or a mother or both are uh, abusive in one form or another, whether it be alcohol or verbal abuse or ment- any kind of mental abuse, but they have a relative nearby. Is there anything they can do as far as going and wanting to go live with the aunt or the uncle if it's possible or, 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 or another relative so they can get out of that environment? Well, we have 50 states, and we have 50, 50 different sets of laws. And then we have 50 different needs for attorneys, and then we have – see how complicated this can be? <laughs> uh, no, it's not that easy. I wish it was, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, every single state has jurisdiction of how they handle this, and every single state's going to have a, a certain way to either remove the child, leave them there, or handle any type of custody. Mm-hmm. What there about isn't a cookie cutter method? Yeah, are there people that you've come across parents when you've done family uh, counseling and and uh, uh, because I know you're not a counselor necessarily, and we you're a consultant. Right, and I'm a coach. About, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I don't do counseling. <laughs> okay, but there are par- but there are parents you run across who probably should have never had children to begin with, and should have never been married to begin with as well. Correct. Yes. Um, I, I, and this happened early in my career. I made a decision one time. I watched the government put two kids back in a home, and I watched those two kids die at the hand of their father, even after we protested. And I made a decision that will never happen again. Oh, God. I mean, that, that, is, just, that is just absolutely terrible. Now, now, since you brought it up, what is the difference between a counselor and what you do as a consultant? Um, I have the same degree they do. But I never did my practicum. I, I didn't go through and actually get licensed because I didn't want a license. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually studied more behavior, and, and then I took my courses in just behavior outside of academia. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a coach. I, I'm, I'm, I'm certified as a teacher. I've gone through all the, all the courses. Mm-hmm. I never went and got a counseling license because I didn't want to be a counselor. If someone needs counseling, I actually mm-hmm. refer them. I've, I've got three counselors here in the Atlanta area that I actually refer to. I am a coach. Now I handle behavior. And when I'm on the radio, I, I handle love and lollipops. But I only am a coach. That's the difference. Oh, okay. So the, so there, it's just a difference of licensing, licensing, but you still go through the practical aspects of it and all the practitioner aspects of it. And so you can identify with the same things that a, a, a counselor can do, but you just don't have the, the, uh, the credibility uh, of the counseling degree, in other words. Yeah, it's like I, I can look at somebody and go, okay, your head hurts because he's a doctor. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not an MD, so I can't treat it. I'm not a licensed counselor, so I don't counsel people. Now, I am I am a pastor, so I handle you know religious things. But mm-hmm. as far as counseling, no, nah, I just coach people. I understand all behavior patterns. I've been in the behavior world for 20-some years, and I actually go into businesses. I coach CEOs, mm-hmm. and I coach them on how to handle their employees or clients, et cetera, in that environment. Boy, we could have sure you used you with my situation, that's for sure. That's yes, for and I go in and handle those. I had to handle a, a situation like that one. 
Yeah. Let me ask you this. When we are born, is that when we start? And, when, and as a child, you start becoming aware of other things around you. Is that when we start developing our character and our behavioral patterns? Uh, while you're in your mother's womb, you develop those. Anytime that, that something, a functioning cell, let's say this, can receive stimu- stimulation from an outside world. Well, we're in mom for nine months, so we are actually receiving stimulation from the outside world. We're receiving nutrition, we're receiving air, we're receiving everything that mom does. Uh, our cells are replicating, and we're receiving all the data that's being downloaded through mom and everything that we can hear. So mm-hmm. it actually starts then. Then once we make our appearance on the scene, our environment, any person, you can look this on Google, uh, our, our behavior, so to speak, our programming is set zero to five. Mm-hmm. So anything zero to five in our environment, and you can look this up on Google later, um, is what influences us the most. Ah. So in other words, as we develop, as we get older, as we start to meet people in the world and we go through our infancy and our teenage years and our, our young adult years, we meet people and we see certain characteristics about them that we like and we do incorporate them into our personalities as we grow as a human being. Let's hopefully we do as we evolve. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, Piaget would be the one you would look up on, on Facebook or, or, or Google. But it's zero to five, zero to six, six mm-hmm. to 11 or 13, and 13 to 18, and then 18 plus. But there's certain developmental stages. But the environment, we always say nature versus nurture. But the environment is going to be the key because mom and dad, extended family, anyone that's around us will have that influence of what we eat, what we say. We actually adapt through our five senses. So mm-hmm. everything zero to five is actually downloaded into us. Basically, it, if you saw the movie The Secret, you've actually learned through some of this. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it's we are a replication of who raised us. Mm-hmm. So we're running a program that was given to us, as we say in every seminar. You're born for success and program to fail. So throughout life, we are programmed by whoever influences us: school, college, who we date who's around us. Again, it is, you really are who you hang around. Really? Yeah. And, and, and do you think that they, that, that holds one back? You think that's maybe, and I'm probably stretching here, but do you think maybe that's a problem that we have in our society that someone wants to go in this direction and all their friends, uh, their peers, their family say, no, don't go there. And that stops them from growing into what they want to be. Do you think that that's a major influence, the environment in which we live? As may yeah, stop, one, yeah. stop and help people too. Yeah, number one reason why people don't pursue their dreams fear. Now, what are we afraid of? How do we, fear is a learned behavior. There's absolutely no reason to have fear if you haven't learned it. Who did we learn it from? The very people who are trying to protect us. I actually did this on my show yesterday uh, mm. because people ask me all the time, why won't I go after what I really, really want? And I'm like, what are you afraid of? Mm. Who taught you to be afraid of that? Okay. Once we, I always tell people, knowledge is power. Yeah. If you have the knowledge to overcome it, I don't like to fly. But after I sat down and talked to 20 pilots, and they've assured me that it's the safest form of transportation, okay, I'll get on a plane. Oh yeah, it's it all is. about knowledge. Yeah. It. it uh, hey, I'm the son of an airline captain, and also <laughs> the and the and the uncle or the, uh, my two uncles flew for the airlines. I flew in the air force. I have a cousin who's still, I think, flying for United back when it was Continental slash now United. It is the safest form of transportation. But here's a funny thing, a little antidote. I had an uncle, my uncle Pete, God rest his soul. He, You couldn't convince him to get into an airplane. He kept saying, how do you get that heavy piece of material, <laughs> metal off the ground and how does it stay up in the air? And when we would sit down and put it on paper and, and, and talk about the physics and dynamics of flight and how right. it occurs, he would be like, I don't understand it. And I'd say, well, Uncle Pete, trust me, it'll be safe. And my father would just look at him and say, Pete, you'll probably never – and he never flew. His whole life he never flew, either took a bus or a train or, or, or he drove. You know, He just couldn't convince him right. to get on an airplane. He wouldn't even go to the airport. Wow. And he I always would, had a fascination with planes, and I used to have to travel every day on an airplane. So you can imagine a guy who doesn't like to fly yeah. having to go to the airport every day. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that. Now, well, that's a phobia that eventually you, you, you know, you, you will overcome most definitely. But, um, you know, getting back to are people born bad? 
with bad behavior. I mean, there are certain people that just seem to be from the day they're born till the day they die, mean, cantankerous, lousy behavior, don't like anybody, don't trust anybody, don't want to be around anybody, and they're perfectly content that way. I mean, are there people that are just born that way or does something happen to them that makes them that? It, it, it's one of those things if we want to go a theological version or we want to go a behavior version. Uh, I'll stay with the behavioral version for our time tonight, but okay. people are born with who they are. And then our, our environment will shape us. But we're also born with who we are. And then we get in the theological, got good and evil. Um, and if you get in the metaphysical, it's the law of uh, polar, polars. Let me say that. Since I have a speech impediment, sometimes it's hard for me to say words. But okay. we have, all right, so we've got metaphysical, we've got theological, and then we've got behavioral. So the answer in each one of these categories would be some form of a yes. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what form of the spectrum. Now, once you place someone in an environment that's conducive to bad, evil, whatever it is, of course, that stimulates who they're going to become. And if they turn out bad, well, you've got some type of root cause that actually initiated that. Is there any way to uh, get them out of that? I mean, through therapy and through counseling, can someone yeah. change it around completely? I mean, look at me. Yeah. Um, I was a disgusting human being who had absolutely no joy for other people, mm. and it all changed. Yeah, I, I, I know that one. Guys that came home from Vietnam, and which we will get to uh, vets in just a little while. There's a word that seems to be missing from our society that I think helps perpetrate bad behavior and obnoxious behavior and the kind of behavior that we, that we see in our society, and it's called responsibility. Have we lost all thought, knowledge, respect for the word responsibility? And, and the fact that our parents don't take their responsibility for themselves, the children learn it, and they don't take responsibility for they themselves as well? Yeah, all you got to do is go out in the public and watch. Uh, I always tell people when I go to a restaurant, okay, I'd like a steak, baked potato, or whatever. But I did not order a side of Screaming Child. Uh, ah. so yeah, we've, we've, we've really lost, uh, and it's my generation, the 50-plus generation that yeah. uh, forgot to teach personal responsibility in that old handbook of parenting. Uh, but we're seeing it everywhere. We're, we're seeing it in the lower generations. And it's always, it's not my fault. It's somebody else. It's how I was raised. It's what's happened to me. It's my environment. Stop. As mm -hmm. soon as you can read them cognitively, it's normally about the age of six. Mm -hmm. You have choice and you can choose. And after that, it's choice. And yes, we're we're not teaching in the school system. I, I had to leave the schools. I couldn't take it anymore. And it was a job that I would have done for free. That's why I always stay. And we have taken personal responsibility completely out of schools. We've taken it out of every single thing that we see. Parents aren't teaching it. Go to a Little League game sometime, and that will show you all you need to see about today in society. Oh, yeah. We, as a matter of fact, I was talking to somebody the other night at the game that I was at. Um and uh, <clears throat> the Predator, the arena football game, and we were talking about that, how parents living vicariously through their children, not realizing their kids' chances of ending up in Major League Baseball or football or anything are slim to none. And, and, the, and if the coach calls a wrong play and the kid is out, oh, the father. I mean, how many fights do you see on the news or on Facebook of uh, parents getting into fights at Little League Baseball games? You're so right. You're absolutely so right, which brings me to my next question. Do parents continue to reward bad behavior as the children grow up? I always tell people behavior ignored is behavior condoned. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a whole society that rewards bad behavior. Um, I, 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 this has been my pet peeve for so long because I was a high school coach. I've gotten to work with NBA teams, college teams, a, you name it, I've done it in the coaching mm -hmm. world and in the behavioral world too. And, and we continuously – reward bad behavior because bad behavior sells and good behavior doesn't. Mm -hmm. Do you think it Look comes at all from... reality. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's one whole genre of nothing but despicable people who do despicable things and get rewarded for it. Right. Yeah. And, and the kids see it. And so they emulate their parents. And when you try to, you know, chastise them or give them some sort of punishment, uh, the parents are mad at you. You know, I remember when I was a kid, if I got in trouble at school, the first thing out of my father's mouth or my mother's was, what did you do? Now it's the parents going to the teacher. What did you do to my child? 
Yeah, I, I used to tell parents when I'd call them, and they'd go, what did you call us? Why did you call us my child to act this way? I said, well, ma'am, I got an A in the class of how to get other people's kids in trouble and get them to do really bad things so I can write them up for no reason. I got an A in that class. <laughs> and what are the, what's the answer? And then they would then they would follow with, I have never seen this behavior at home. And then I'll say, be careful who you're talking to. I've done all yeah. research. I've got degrees in it. And let me tell you something right now. A behavior displayed at school has been displayed numerous times, not only at home, but mm -hmm. in front of you. Mm -hmm. So save it. And do you also think maybe some of the parents bring that bad behavior on in that they want their children to do this or do that, and the children are like, look, that's not what I want to do. You know, I remember a case when I was growing up. This, uh, this family had uh, uh, three or four children, and the mother wanted the, the little girl to learn how to play piano. And she hated playing piano and she really hated it. And finally, she turned to her mother in a fit of temper one day and said, I don't want to play piano, but I would like to learn how to play the uh, clarinet or something. It was in the band. She said, I don't like the piano. I like to listen to it. I don't want to play it, but I would like to learn how to play. It. I think it was the clarinet. I'm not sure. Might have been right. another instrument. I mean, do you think sometimes parents bring out the worst in their own children by forcing uh, them to do yeah. things they don't want to do? Yeah, it was funny. I asked a psychiatrist friend of mine and said, um, why are so many kids in therapy? Because parents. And then a friend of mine, uh, David Benzel, who works with the uh, um, Tennis Association, has told me he did a study. Mm -hmm. And then, and I believe it after coaching high school for so many years, the average athlete becomes just completely fed up with sports at the age of 13. Why? Because they're inundated with sports. And now they're playing for mom and dad. And, and I always tell fathers, why do you take a football to the hospital when your child's born? <laughs> I think that's uh, more for the not, father than it's for him. Yeah. Yeah. I always told parents, look, it's their destiny. It's their life. Look at my oldest son. He'll be 33 this year. He can't stand sports unless he's watching them. Okay. What did his father do for a living? I was a basketball coach yeah. for years. And my son told me, dad, I don't really like basketball. That's cool. What do you want to do? I want to be an artist. Let's do it. It's more of, yes, okay, moms and dads are trying to relive the childhood they didn't have. Right. And then you, you've got all these expectations heaped on these kids. I remember one year I walked in the locker room. The kids are getting ready to graduate last game of the season. And I said, who really wants to go on and play at the next level? And we had about three or four kids on that team. And they all told me none of them did. They're like, oh. coach, we're just tired. We just want to be normal people again. And we don't really care if we play ever again. Wow. And that was really sad because these kids had talent. Yeah. You think that that really – I mean I see this going on now. Um, it was about a week or two ago, Scott, that the president's daughter, I think Malia, I believe, is the oldest daughter. She announced that she's going to go to Harvard. But between starting in 2017 and when she graduates from high school in about six weeks or so, she's going to take a year off. And I was talking right. to one of my coworkers the other day, a young man who's – just in college now, I think he's in his uh, sophomore year. I said, is that becoming a, a prevalent thing? He said, oh, yeah. He said, "He said, when did you go to school? I said, oh, I, I went when Abraham Lincoln was president. I said, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, I guess, it's as grueling as it is today. He said, it is. He said, because everybody is getting prepared at a very young age for college. And he said, depending upon the teachers you get, you, you're burned out by the by the time you graduate from high school and you want to take some time and just rest your brain and maybe go off and do something else. I mean, is that becoming something that this generation, the millennials, is starting to do more and more to to sort of take a deep breath before they get into the real world? I tell kids, I tell parents now, because the educational system's not what it was <laughs> when I was a kid, and, and I know you're a little older than I am, mm -hmm. and – I hate to break it to these kids, but the curriculum that you and I had is there. There's is nowhere close to what we did. Now, what they do have is a lot of busy work. Mm -hmm. I, I told my class one time I taught chemistry and physics, and I told them I said I had one week to memorize the periodic table. One week, okay. you got to get it handed to you for every test. I had one week to memorize it. Mm. Big yeah. difference in curriculum, yeah. and, and I'm just like. But I tell so many kids now and so many parents, and, and I taught in the South, the curriculum now is not set up for kids to go to college. It's mm -hmm. been watered down to the point now I tell kids, for one, the kids are not maturing at the rate we did because they don't have responsibility placed on them. Mm -hmm. Take a year off, figure out who you are. 
I'm like, if you want to find yourself, don't cost your parents 20 grand. Go get a job, find yourself for a year. College ain't going anywhere. Right. SAT scores aren't really going to matter once you're out of school. Mm-hmm. And then go figure out who you are, what degree program you specifically want to go into, or mentorship if you find out you don't want to go to school. And one of the facts I always told kids was, if you look at college degrees now that pay you back, and I just had this talk, I just did a seminar on this, mm-hmm. mathematics, finance, engineering, architecture, it, they're in some type of math-related field. Please forgive me, uh, liberal arts folks. Uh, but if you want to pay your college degree back now, those are the fields that, if you look on mm-hmm. Forbes, money, whatever it is, mm-hmm. they've got a graph of it. And this was an article on Forbes, I think, six months ago. Mm-hmm. And it's something I've been trying to tell parents for years. Make sure that this is a degree, one, that you love, of course, but two, that you can pay the bills with. Mm-hmm. And if you have to take a year off and do the community college thing, do it. Do what it takes to make sure that you are pursuing what you're meant to do. Yeah. Who 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 made the rule that you've got to go straight to college? <laughs> I took eight yeah. years off, and I, yeah. but when I went back, I was serious about it and I had to pay my own way. Yeah, I I uh, I went right from high school to the military, and when I did eventually get to go to college, which was a few years later uh, in Washington at GW, uh, I really enjoyed it because I was studying what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to do in life, and uh, you know, I wanted to study journalism in spite of the dyslexia, and I, I enjoyed it. But I, I don't think uh, uh, when you're in college thinking you want to be a talk show host is a good way to earn any money back. I'll be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> I really don't think that's the way to go. Uh, listen, let's talk about your uh, – your. You, you know, you do a talk show, but you also do a lot of seminars for businesses, and uh, you, have a new bo- you have a new book out. It's called It's Not Them, It's You. Um, and uh, I want to discuss some topics that are in the book. Uh, why, uh, why, you can't, why can't you separate personal behavior from your public behavior or at, at all? Why can't you separate one from the other? God knows politicians would like us to think that. You're still the same person. You still mm-hmm. have the same thoughts. You still have the same programming. You still have the same behaviors. You still have all the same things. And last time I looked, it's still you. So mm-hmm. I always tell people when they go to Disney World, it's funny. You, you're on one side of the concrete, but when you walk into the happiest place on earth, you're a different person. For yes. some reason, you feel better. Aren't you mm-hmm. still on the same concrete? Didn't the same concrete company do that? Well, aren't you the same person that drove to work, who just entered mm-hmm. the building? Yeah. Still the same person. Still the same behavior, still the same feelings, still the same mannerisms. Yeah. So, but, no, you're not a different person. <laughs> yeah. But, but I will tell you that there is a feeling. I'll be perfectly honest with you. And I notice this around Christmas time every year, Scott. Somehow we change as people, unless you go with your wife shopping at Christmas and then that's a disaster. <laughs> but, but generally speaking, around Christmas time, we all seem to be in better humor. We all seem to be a little more understanding, a little more compassionate, a little more um, forgiving. Um, I know when I've been on vacation or I'm doing what I love to do, I'm a little more understanding and a little more forgiving, but sometimes people, you know, they're handcuffed to their job and they hate it. And, and, you know, and, and that's probably where a lot of drugs and alcohol problems stem from, uh, as well as other things. So I, I'm, you know, yeah, I know you can't separate You're you're the same person outside of the building that you are in. But sometimes the environment inside the building, I guess, changes a person that now, oh, now I got to act like an adult. I got to act businesslike instead of home playing with trains with my children or something. <clears throat> yeah, we all have this facade that we wear. I always tell people, I mean, it's just like Phantom of the Opera. We all wear a mask. It depends on what that mask is. Yeah. Do we truly know who people are? No, of course not. I uh, go to any business seminar and you can look around the room. But people always take me and go, who's happy, who's not? Uh, who's good to date and who's not? And I'll go around the room and tell them. Uh, just from the behavioral patterns that people display. Now, yeah, at, at Christmas time, people do tend to be a little more jolly, but we've been socialized to be that way. Mm-hmm. Chris, the, the, we have the spirit of Christmas, as we say, uh, or the movie Scrooge. But <laughs> is it real? Because then January comes. Yeah. And now the suicide rate, suicide rate's always highest in holidays. Yeah. So now we've had to become real people again. Yeah. And, that, and then the bills start coming in for Christmas, you know? So. Yep. Yep, like my mother always used to say, now it's time to put Christmas back in the box after after New Year's. 
Yeah. You, uh, you, you talk about here about employees who hire or, or the correct uh, way for employers to hire employees and ask the correct questions. What are some of those uh, identifiers uh, that you look for that you encourage employers to look for in employees? I always tell people, you're hiring a child who's doing a behavior pattern that was given to them by every single person that's touched them in their family. So you're really hiring mom and dad or grandma and grandpa from a programming standpoint. Now, once you get them on the premises, what is the actual job they're going to be doing? I've never understood why we ask separate questions from the job. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, if this can be a customer service rep, give them a real-time question on how they would handle something. Because what they say there will reveal who they are. Mm -hmm. And I always give them a real-time question. you got a client that come in, they're irate about something they didn't get, let's say, a grocery store. Uh, they've got a hole in their milk. They're irate about it. What do you do? Mm. Now they've got an open-ended question, and you will see what they have learned about people. Mm -hmm. Number one complaint I get from employers now that would be a retail establishment, <clears throat> a grocery store, movie theater, et cetera, is the kids don't have basic social skills. Yes. Not even basic. I actually had to – I looked at a girl when I – this was at a grocery store – and she's texting somebody. And I said, would you like me for me to finish your text so you can actually ring me up? Mm -hmm. And she got mad. Okay. So I said, stop for a second. Do you mind ringing me up? And she got an attitude. I said, do you realize that your general manager is a good friend of mine? I'll tell you what. Hold on. I called him while I stood in line. And she was fired on the spot. Mm -hmm. wow. They don't have the basic skill set <clears throat> to do the job. So if you ask them a specific skill set question, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle the situation? If you're placed in this environment, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. It's like a sales call. If I'm hiring someone to sell my product, okay, here's our product. I'm sure you've done the research on my product. How are you going to sell it to me? Let's do this right now. Mm -hmm. Because I am, I, I'm very clear on my expectations. And even as a coach, I will tell you exactly what I'm looking for. Employ, employers, I always tell people, don't be afraid to let your competitors Hire the people you don't want. You don't lower your standard because you feel like that's all that's coming through the door. If you'll improve the conditions of which your employees work, they'll come in droves. Right, right, right. If you see, if you go into a business, I've always found this out, and you, and you, whether it's fast food or whatever, and suddenly this week there's five new employees, and two weeks later there's a couple new employees, and there's a revolving door. And then there's something wrong. Either, either, either what. Either they're not mature enough to handle a job or there's something wrong with the working conditions where they are. Yeah, I mean, and that's how I got the title for the book was It's Not Them, It's You. Or so CEOs, senior VPs, general managers, they will always reflect who you are. If they're hateful and they're lazy and they're not cleaning your store and they're not doing what you're supposed to do, I'll assume that's how you act. Mm -hmm. If they're on the ball, if your store's spotless, if they understand customer service, if they're courteous, then I'll know what you're like. Mm -hmm. Fairmont hotels are a great example. I don't mean to promote one or the other, mm -hmm. but they're absolutely amazing. Trump, Chick-fil-A, these are certain companies. I've actually gone through and analyzed every single company for this for this book. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is I'd just go sit. I wouldn't talk to anybody. And I would sit for 10 minutes and just watch employees and go to the next door and watch employees and go to the next one. What I saw was in those chains – was repetitious customer service, same uniform, same cleanliness. There was a uniformity there that could be identified throughout each company. Mm -hmm. there, and there I was, understood that. <clears throat> yeah. There was branding, and, 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 and the managers held up to it. That's the problem. Sometimes when you get uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stores that are owned by uh, separate people, they don't always keep up the product quality and they don't always keep up the employee quality, clean clothes, uh, neat appearance and politeness to the customers. Yeah. I, I did a, a funny video one time for YouTube just, just to be funny, but I told people I, anything I need to know about your company, I can tell by going in your restaurant because mm. if your restaurant's dirty and you're handling my food, what's that tell me about my food? Now, if you're, restroom it's completely spotless as much as it can dealing with the public i know that you're going to take care of my customer service needs your sales product your sales force is going to be there the customer knowledge is going to be there and you're going to do what it takes to make me happy happy as a consumer mm -hmm. if your if your bathroom is a complete mess and that attention to detail has not been addressed 
why would you ever address any other detail or problem that I have? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Scott, how can they uh, – <clears throat> we're talking to Scott Farrell. His new book is It's Not Them, It's You. Uh, how can I get a hold of you for um, to come in and talk at a seminar, and how can they get a hold of your book? Uh, go to my website, easiest way. Let me spell that because mom and dad uh, subtracted a letter. ScottFarrell.com, yes. S-C-O-T. F E R R E L L dot com. The easiest way to find me, or they can go by Facebook. All right. Well, listen. Be, and now I know you also have relationships. You you deal with with marital problems, children, families, etc. And I just want to get into that a little bit here. Um, uh, in, in, are there people that you just say, you know, you you folks should have never been married to begin with? <laughs> I think every single person who's actually been around a married couple, friend, pastor, counselor, salesman, <laughs> everybody says it. I mean, you look at people and go, okay, explain to me again how the two of you ended up being married. Please yeah. explain this to me. Yeah. What is of it that you saw? You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest <laughs> with you. I'm I'm very good at dating. I'm not much good at the marriage thing. Just ask the ex. and But – that's a long telephone call, but I mean, and the problem I think in divorce, and this is a problem worldwide, is parents uh, take what children believe is their fault for the divorce, and sometimes they stretch those children and, and like saltwater taffy, put bad bu- things into their head, bad things about mom and dad, uh, depending upon who you're talking to, and and they really ruin those kids as far as any uh, good relationships they may have in their lives uh, by their divorce. Yeah, oh, we see that a lot. I mean, it, it, it's just look at the teenage, um, I guess, out of wedlock burst in this country. Mm-hmm. It, it depends on um, now. It's it's every race now is above fifty seven percent. I actually had to do this talk a few months ago, and yeah, we we use the kids as ping pong as collateral, and what they end up becoming is collateral damage. And they feel like because of what they've witnessed and what's been programmed into them, that a relationship, a sustainable, loving relationship, which they've never seen, could be an impossibility down the line for themselves. And I have a lot of people call me uh, just to go from a behavioral standpoint, what can I do about this? Why do I feel this way? And I'll say from a programming standpoint, from behavior, this is what's taking place. And I'll ask them generally, have you ever seen a couple? who loved each other and had a long relationship that was true to form for what you think marriage should be. And so many will say, no, I haven't. Hmm. Hmm. And I, it was funny. I, I decided to do the proverbial drive across the country trip. Okay. Next time I'll fly. Um, but <laughs> I drove from here to LA. I did a TV show and drove home because I wanted to see all the states. Right. Well, the whole time I was out, every single place I went, I would poll teen- teenagers on that very thing. Do you feel like a relationship is sustainable or your parents divorced? And if you do, why? If you don't, why? Mm-hmm. And I interviewed about 300 teenagers. Mm-hmm. I didn't get one kid, and this was alarming, that had a positive response to that question. And these are, I just randomly walk up to somebody at a, at a, at a Walmart and go, hey, uh, I'm from Georgia. I'm doing a book. Uh, can I ask you a couple questions? Yeah. And I did it in every single state I drove through. Do you think that society uh, – my producer brings this up, uh, EW. Do you think society is making divorce more acceptable? And that's why maybe people are getting married for all the wrong reasons, figuring they can get easily divorced? Yeah, and the thing is, our, our population's increased. It used to be, for my generation, it was a way to get out of the house. Well, so many people now, we, 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 we live in a microwave society. And so if we get into it, we can just get back out of it. And, it, it, again, it's a theological and behavioral issue. You look at it from a theological standpoint, do we still believe in God? If you look at it from a behavioral standpoint, have we ever seen a successful model of relationship? Look at our music, look at our movies, look at our TV shows, look at reality TV, look at all the things that that tear apart relationships. Number one reason why we're in, in such bad straits now is that as a country is the death of the family. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yes. It, it, it's really sad what is taking place now. Yes. And, and, and to me, uh, I don't care if it's a man and a woman, two women, two men. If you are in a loving environment – 
those children will respond to that and blossom. And it doesn't mean that if you're a gay couple, as compared to a straight couple, that you're going to take on the the sexual characteristics of the gay couple. But if you're in a loving and caring environment, it doesn't matter. It could be an aunt and an uncle, which I was raised with for about five or six years of my life or whatever. If it's a loving environment, children will grow. They'll, they'll prosper from that love and it'll go with them as they go through life and they'll look at life and relationships in a wonderful and beautiful manner. At least that's what I think, but you are the expert. Well, I always tell people, I look at Jungle Book's out now, right, uh, mm-hmm. the, the new new version. Okay, well, who was he raised by? Was he raised by wolves? But they loved him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> he got yeah. the animal king in his best till, till everybody showed up and tried to eat him. But it, it's who has given you a reason to believe that a loving, sustainable relationship is possible. Mm-hmm. And if you look at TV movies, commercials, you don't see one anymore. You see an acceptability of I'm going to do what I want when I want, regardless of the outcome and how other people feel or the damage it does. Mm-hmm. And and I get this because I'm that guy that you dread in public. I'll come up and go, why don't you do that? Hey, you got a second? Can I ask you a couple questions? Mm-hmm. I'm that guy. Why don't you mm-hmm. Why don't you do that? Well, <laughs> what'd you do about this? And every time when I go out and do research, I've got a new book coming out too. What men don't get about women? I went out and asked 1,000 women, what is it we don't get? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, if y'all feel that way, what's that we don't get? And yeah. it's alarming the answers you'll receive. Well, I always used to love it when my wife would look at me, and it's a joke, but it's the truth. When when she'd be in a bad mood, and I look at her and say, "What?" and she'd say, "Well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you." <laughs> and and I'd heard that so often in my life, anyway, that I finally just answered her and said, "Okay, keep it to yourself, but when you want to let me know, uh, let me know." What are what is one of the most common? mistakes that people make in dating trying to allow another person to validate them i I just did a singles product actually i'll be on my website here in a couple of weeks Mm -hmm. i always tell people you got to be you before you can go out and have a number two you got to know who you are what your purpose is what your plan is who created you what you're going to do in life what pleases you what your passions are what profession you want to go into and i make people make a list before i married my my wife i had a hundred things that the next person I dated had to have. And my wife had all 100. Mm. I knew exactly what I wanted. And I knew who I was looking for. And I told people, when you go out on a date, it's not in the time for you to please someone else. It's a job interview. You are interviewing somebody for two hours over dinner on whether you're going to give them another chance to go out with you. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take that time to find out who they are, what they want, where they are spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, do the job interview. If you were getting ready to give this person $100,000 a year salary, mm-hmm. I believe you'd do some research. Well, why don't you do the same for your dating life? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how yeah. I approached dating. It was an opportunity to meet some wonderful women, but at the same time, I knew exactly the criteria for who I was going to date. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've been very fortunate lately. I met somebody – uh, not long ago when we've been seeing each other when we can, and she's just a really wonderful, wonderful lady in, in every sense of the word. With the time that we have left here, we got about six or seven minutes left, uh, Scott. <clears throat> I want to talk about our vets who are coming home from overseas um, that may not have arms or legs anymore. They may have physical effects. They have mental effects um, to the war. Um Suicide rates amongst veterans is very, very high. It always usually is if there's a war involved. And uh, I know during the Vietnam War, a lot of men came home. And even to this very day, a lot of homelessness, so they commit suicide. What can we do to help our veterans overcome some of these problems? What can we do to help them get better? What do we need to know? How can we educate ourselves if, if someone's listening out there and a son or a daughter are overseas fighting in Iraq or Iran or one of these other uh, Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and we don't have that many troops over there now, but we do have them or they've been home for a while. What do we need to know to help them to get back into the life that they had that, that quite frankly, it, it tears families apart? Yeah, I, I have to deal with that a lot. And, and thanks to the veterans, it's, I, my uncle was at Pearl Harbor and the other mm. one was part of the South Pacific invasion. Um, so two heroes there and thank you for your service. Um, 
We I just did my job. Just did yeah, my job. We have to. Yeah, we've got to understand that they've. And, and if you saw any live action too, they've just seen some of the most horrific thing that a human could ever see, and they've just endured some of the most horrific things that it could ever happen to a human. Yep. And we have to understand that when they get back, we got to love them. We got to love them. I'm not waiting on the government to solve this because they've all messed this up. Yeah. But we as a community, we as a family, we as a church, we as a, a, a community center, we as whatever it is, we've got to embrace every single soldier, male, female, I don't care who it is. And we got to love them. And then we got to understand them. And then we got to give them a chance. And then we got to help them. And then we got to understand again. We got to love some more. And then we got to understand them. And we got to help them. That's mm-hmm. the first step. That's what I tell people. You got a loved one who was in the ministry and comes home. Just love them. Give mm-hmm. them some space. Give them some time to acclimate back to being in so-called normal life mm-hmm. and love them and understand them and support them and listen to them and be there. That's mm-hmm. step one. Because if we're waiting on the government to fix it, it ain't going to happen. No. Uh, PTSD is rampant. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got several friends with it. My cousin died because of it. He was mm-hmm. in Vietnam. My cousin was the guy who had to go around and pick up body parts. Oh, God. And my, my cousin, to, to this day, he's passed away since, but would never discuss it. As no. my uncle would never discuss Pearl Harbor with me. No, no. And <clears throat> because it was so horrific, he could not even discuss it. And those are two individuals that never recovered. And we, we, we just don't have enough understanding of what they went through. It's, um, it's about as grotesque and as immoral a thing that, is necessary for countries to move forward and to not be overtaken by governments and regimes that they don't want to be overtaken for them, right. communism, et cetera, terrorism nowadays. But it's, it's about as immoral as it gets. Again, it's necessary at times, but it is immoral. And I always wondered why my father never talked about being in the Pacific. I always wondered why my uncles never talked about being in Europe. And then when I served and my fellow uh, service men and women who uh, were with us in Vietnam. Uh, when I came home, uh, the first thing my father said to my mother, when he comes home, stay away from him. Leave him alone. Let him be yeah. him. Let him unwind. He has been through hell. She didn't quite understand that, and she was always poking me for questions until one day I blew up, and I said, Dad, i got to go to a hotel. This, I can't do this. I just can't. And so for a month, I went over and stayed at a hotel, uh, that we knew the owner of, and he gave me a room uh, almost free for a whole month. And all I did was just try to decompress. And uh, but right. it took me years. It took me years. You you can see them come home, Scott, with two arms and two legs, two eyes, two ears, the same as they left. But what's going on between their ears? What happened in their brain? Is is uh, it can destroy lives and send you in a tailspin that you never will come out of? Yeah, I always tell soldiers who ask me. I'll say, I'm ready when you're ready. Mm-hmm. So when you're ready, I'll be ready. And and I, I go out of my way. To, if I see a soldier in public, I either pay for the meal, hug them, kiss them, mm-hmm. thank them. Because I know once you've been to hell and you've come back, you might want some appreciation, some love, and some space. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to see that our young people today coming home are treated with respect and honor. We weren't, but maybe what we yeah. went through has helped uh, these young people uh, find their way and – and um, and be treated a little bit nicer. But no, if you wait for the VA, you're going to wait till hell freezes over. Because I used to say to my ex, uh, <clears throat> if I have a toothache and I'm going to the VA hospital, shoot me on the way out because I ain't coming back out alive. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, know, I'm, you I'm understand. <laughs> yeah, oh, I understand it completely. Oh, oh, too well. Oh, too well. And And it's not the VA's fault itself in a sense. Uh, they don't have the money uh, all the time. They don't have the great pay for doctors and nurses, and sometimes that shows up when it comes to the care. But we need to care about them. And if you have a loved one out there, get them to a, 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 a counselor. Get them someplace that they can talk it out and, and, and get through it all because it, it's a very difficult time. Would you believe the hour has gone by already? It's amazing how fast it goes when you're having fun. Yes, absolutely. We've been talking to Scott Farrell. Scott, how can people get a hold of you? And don't forget to get his new book, It's Not Them, It's Me. You can listen to his seminars, which are across between Dahlia and uh, Dr. Fraser Crane. And by the way, I know Kelsey Grammer very well. I know Kelsey. Kelsey grew up in Fort Lauderdale with my brother. Wow. Give me, give me a shout-out to me. They can give me my website, scottfarrell.com, S-C-O-T, 
F E R R E L L dot com, and head on by my Facebook page and like it. Absolutely, and I I, I think I'm, I've got to get you on my Facebook page as it is. And I, Scott, thank you so very much. We're going to have you back at some point, but I really enjoyed this hour. Bruce was absolutely correct. You're a delightful young man. And I wish you and your lovely wife, who meets all your 100 expectations, all, all the all the very best, and your three children, who I know are highly successful young people. And I thank you again very much for taking the time to join us here on the Express. Oh, thank you for having me. Take care. All right. And I want to thank all of you out there for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us here tonight. Scott Farrell was our guest. To stay in touch with me, go to Facebook.com, go to Gary Allen, A-L-A-N, go to YouTube.com, Gary Allen, The Express Interviews, to listen to any of my past shows. This show will repeat itself on Thursday night on DiversityBroadcastNetwork.com at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and also ProgressiveVoices.com. Uh, and if you're running around, go into uh, TuneIn.com, go to TMV Cafe, register, and you can listen to us any old time. On behalf of all of us here at TMV Cafe, this is Gary Allen for The Express. Thank you for joining us this week. See you next. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. You've been listening to The Express with Gary Allen. Join us here every Tuesday night at 10 for more captivating talk with Gary Allen. See you next time on The Express.